So the scripture reading, 1 Corinthians 16, verse, starting in verse 19. It says, The churches of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord with the church that is in their house. All the brethren greet you, greet one another with a holy kiss. The salutation of me, Paul, with my own hand. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema, maranatha. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we do pray as we come to the conclusion of the book that we don't just label it conclusion and, and move on past it. That we pay attention to some of the things that we can learn and glean in this conclusion. Uh, the greeting from the saints, the statement that Paul makes, and, and the affection that he shows at the end. Uh, Father, we pray that... Uh, that we might be prepared to be ministers of Jesus Christ and, uh, and used by you uh, in the world that we live in. Uh, as I said before when we were having announcements, Father, we do pray for those that are in authority over us, all the difficulties in these last couple months, in the last couple days, uh, the decisions that they face, the things that have to go on the, between the, uh, uh, the protection and the justice system, Father, we, we thank you that you instituted human government and we have this opportunity to meet together. But as we study your Bible, then use us for your honor and glory, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. We began this journey through 1 Corinthians back on March the 5th, 2017. And uh, here it is for the record, May 31st, 2020. And uh, we'll, we'll bring the book to a conclusion I wondered, as I said, wrote that statement down uh, on my paper here, is that I wonder how long it took the Corinthians to study the book, the letter, the epistle they got. Not just read it. There's certainly, as soon as they got it, they read it to the whole congregation. Uh, but there is so much detail in there that there's no way you just read it and say, I got it. So that the Corinthians had to study what Paul wrote as much as we did. And I just wondered how long it took them to study it, not just to read it. In this concluding section here, in verses 19 through 21, we have a, a salutation and a, a, a salute and a salutation. In verse 22, we have an exclamatory pronouncement. Quite, quite amazing statement there. Then in verses 23 and 24, we have Paul's personal sentiment as he closes the book. And, uh, and those, that's the little outline that we'll look at look, as we look at these verses. It starts in, in verse 19 there where Paul, he had already talked about some people that are at Corinth that came to visit him. And, uh, and, and now the people that he's with are going to send greetings to the Corinthians. So the Corinthians sent some information to the Apostle Paul. And now as Paul concludes, he's, he writes verse chapter uh, 16 verse 19, the churches of Asia salute you. And, uh, and so now it's the people that are where Paul's at sending greetings to the Corinthian saints. And uh, so Paul, we know he's at Ephesus. You remember verse 8 of the same chapter says, but I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost. So we know that Paul is at Ephesus. So when he says the churches of Asia salute you, uh, one of those churches is Ephesus where we get, have the book of Ephesians there. So that's one of them, but it says the church is. Um, the other churches are churches that perhaps Paul's never been. Uh, over in Acts chapter 19 and verse 10, when the Apostle Paul uh, was at Ephesus and where he wrote 1 Corinthians from, uh, he, he spent at first two years teaching in that school and it says uh, 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 and when these things were in uh, no, it says uh, and this continued for the space of two years so that all they in Asia heard the word of the Lord and so Paul as, as he ministered at Ephesus there was actually a three year span but the first two years he was teaching and in that teaching the, the gospel message the word of the Lord spread to the, all of Asia both, it says both to the Jews and to the Greek and as a result of that, there's other churches that were established that Paul, just from Ephesus, he didn't go there, he hadn't seen them. For instance, come over to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 1, it says, For I would that ye knew what great 
conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. Well, there's two other churches of Asia. Uh, they, he, the people at Colossae, some of them never even seen the Apostle Paul because he hasn't been to that city. But yet from Ephesus, there's a, a church established in the city of Colossae. And he also mentions another, another church in Laodicea. And that's a, a tri-city area there in Asia. So there, when he says the churches of Asia salute you, he's definitely including Laodicea, Colossae, and Ephesus as those that are sending greetings to the Corinthians. While we're at Colossae here, at Colossians, look at chapter 4 and look at verse 16. It says, when this epistle is read among you, cause it to be read also in the church of, Laod of the Laodiceans, and that ye likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. And so they, they circulated these letters, and as we talk about the Bible and how we got the Bible, uh, there's no way, like I said, when the Corinthians read 1 Corinthians, they weren't done reading it. <laughs> they had to study the details that Paul had in there. And when these churches received these epistles, they didn't hang on to them, they sent them to other, epistle, to other churches. And certainly if you're going to send the epistle to the other church, you're not going to give up the epistle. You might send the original on. I, don't, I imagine they did that. But they made a copy before they sent it on. And that's how the New Testament got put together. That's how we have Paul's epistles today. Because they recognized this is God's word to us. And they weren't going to let go of that. They made copies. And those copies were preserved through time. The originals never were preserved. And... Uh, so, but, and, and here, when, the, the, the epist when they're done reading the letter of Colossians, they, they're going to send it to Laodicea for that, it to be read there. And then it says, and read the epistle from Laodicea. Notice it didn't say, read the epistle to Laodicea. And that is from Laodicea. I believe that would be the book of Ephesians, the, the letter of Ephesus. That Ephesus, uh, Ephesians saints sent their letter over to Laodicea like the Colossians are going to do. And then now the people in Colossae are waiting to receive the book of Ephesians, so the letter from Ephesus, uh, so they could read it there. I think that's the reference to the epistle from Laodicea. So, but anyhow, you, you see how they circulated, but also the whole point of this is the greetings uh, that the, the, these churches are sending one to another. They, they understand their local assemblies, but they're part of the body of Christ. They have the same doctrine, and that doctrine comes from the Apostle Paul, and so they're circulating Paul's letters among them, and the saints send greetings to the, the church of, uh, of, of Corinth, as we're reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. So back to that verse 19 of chapter 16 of 1 Corinthians. The churches of Asia salute you. Then he says, Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord. Now, much is just an emphasis that there is more than just a greeting. There's a little bit more affection, a little bit more interest, a little bit more uh, wanting to know. Not, I'm just not part of the group here. These two people personally want to send greetings to the church at, at Corinth. And the reason they would do that is they used to live at Corinth. And uh, we've been going through the book of Acts and, and comparing things, and there's just a couple of details that we need to pick up again or just to remind ourselves of. So hold your place in 1 Corinthians and come to Acts chapter um, 18. Yeah, we can just start there. Acts chapter 18. I think it was last week that I said, I hope you understand this connection to the book of Acts with Corinthians as well as I have been bringing it out as well as I know it and hopefully even better. But the, the point is, is the, when these statements are made, there's things there that you can understand why it's being made. In 1 Corinthians chapter 18, no, Acts chapter 18 verses 1 and 2, it says, After these things Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born, now catch this detail, born in Pontius, lately come from Italy, with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome, and came unto them. That is, Paul came unto them, and they were tent makers, and we've already talked about, they weren't believers, they became believers as Paul began to preach in the synagogue, and the, the church at Corinth didn't meet in their house, 
Uh, they, they actually were just one of the ones who took Paul in because he was a tent maker and they both can make money together. And, uh, but it wasn't long that these people got saved and became part of the ministry of the Apostle Paul. So that Paul spends a year and a half at Corinth and then he leaves. Look over verse 18. It says, And Paul after, uh, after this tarried there yet a good while and then took his leave of the brethren and sailed thence into Syria with Priscilla and Aquila having shown his he head in Centria for he had a vow. And he came to Ephesus and left them there. So Paul as he's going to travel to Jerusalem he, on the way there, they, there's a stopover at Ephesus. He preaches, gets some result in his preaching, promised to come back. But he goes on to Jerusalem, but he left Aquila and Priscilla there at Ephesus. Now you might recall then, as you get down to the end of the chapter, Apollos shows up and he only knew the baptism of John. These people not only got saved, they understood Paul's message. They're more advanced in the revelation of God than... than uh, than even Apollos, who was an eloquent speaker. So in verse 26 it says, And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, that's Apollos, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him in unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. Now this couple is an exceptional couple. I, I can't help it, I just got to say it. Uh, most of you have not met Dan's parents, Bob and Elfrida. Uh, most of you knew Elfrida, uh, but Bob's been gone for a long time. I can't read Aquil and Priscilla without thinking of them. They brought people into their house, they had Bible studies, even after Bob passed away there was a man who was studying with them at their home, he got saved, wanted to know more about scripture, he asked Alfredo, can you keep teaching me? And uh, they used their home to get the gospel out, to get people edified, just like Aquila and Priscilla did. Here they are at Ephesus, they bring Apollos up to date, and when you finish this chapter, he's now, because he's more up to date, he's able to help them much at Corinth. He leaves Ephesus and he goes to Corinth. So Apollos goes to Corinth, and then Paul works his way back, and it's got to be a year later because he's walking back. From, from Jerusalem all the way back to Ephesus. He promised to come back. So in Acts chapter 19 verse 1 it says, It came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul having passed through the upper coast, that's how I know he traveled, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples and so forth. And then down in verse 10, he, 9 and 10, he's in that school and he spends two years there. And Paul, that's where Paul wrote 1 Corinthians from. During the, after verse 10 there of chapter 19. So Paul's at Ephesus, he's come back, but Aquila and Priscilla have now been at Ephesus almost four years. Uh, they, they, left, they, they left, they spent a few years at Corinth or more, we don't know how long they were there before Paul showed up. They come to Ephesus, Paul spends two years, then he spends another year, and they don't leave until Paul leaves. But uh, Paul's there at, at Ephesus, and the point of saying that is in Corinthians, when he's writing the first Corinthians, he says, Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord with the church that is in their house. When they went to Ephesus, they started, they not only ministered to Apollos, they had a church in their home. It, 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 uh, you know, I don't know how many churches, I know in Rome there's like three home churches that are mentioned. I don't know how many are at Ephesus, how many are at Corinth. Uh, but they didn't have a church in their home at Corinth, but when they went to Ephesus, now there's a church in their home. And, and Paul, when he left there, you still in Acts, Acts chapter 20, verse 1, Paul finally leaves Ephesus. And so they've been there like a four-year time, and in that short time that they're there, they have a church in their house. But Paul leaves Ephesus, and it says in chapter 20, verse 1, After the uproar was ceased, Paul called unto him his disciples, and embraced them, and departed to go into Macedonia. And when he had come over those parts, and had given them much exhortation, he came to Greece. So, it's there that Paul, he now leaves, and when he leaves, we've already studied the fact that he's taken up this collection, and there is, there, he spends a lot, little bit of time there in Macedonia. That's when he wrote 2 Corinthians, preparing them, now I'm going to come. When he gets to Greece there in verses 2 and 3, that's when he wrote the book of Romans. And when he writes the book of Romans, so it's got to be another year and a half, maybe two, maybe you could stretch it to three, after Paul left Ephesus. But in verse 3, he wrote the book of Romans. The reason I'm saying that, come to Romans chapter 16. 
I already pointed out to you, verse 23, that that area in Greece, Paul is actually at Corinth. That's part of Greece. And in Romans chapter 16, verse 23, he says, Gaius, my host, uh, and the whole church saluteth you. So he's staying at Gaius' house. But look at chapter 16, verse 3. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ, who have for my, for my life laid down their own necks, to, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. <laughs> Here they are. They've only been in Rome two, maybe you could stretch it three years. And when Paul writes from Corinth to the Romans, he, sa he sends greetings to Aquila and Priscilla. Maybe that, th that uproar that took place at Ephesus, they risked their life to save the Apostle Paul. And we're still glad they did, aren't we? All the churches are glad, all the churches of the Gentiles. Paul hadn't finished writing, he didn't write his prison epistles yet. And, and so they risked their life for the Apostle Paul, but there they are, and they got a church that's in their house. Now, another part about that is they're there at, in Rome. They have a church in their house at Rome. The last time their name is mentioned is in 2 Timothy, and you don't need to read, I'm going to read it to you. But there, in, there in, in 2 Timothy, Paul is writing Timothy, who is now at Ephesus. And their people in Ephesus are departing from the faith. In fact, he wrote, all those in Asia have turned from me. And as he writes about this departure of the faith and telling Timothy to stand and keep telling them to preach no other doctrine, that there, as other people are departing, with Timothy is Priscilla and Aquila, faithful to the 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 Apostle Paul and the message of grace, mostly, uh, all through their life, even to the end of Paul's life. Because it says in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 19, Salute Priscilla and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. So there they are. They've left Rome. They've done ministering to Rome. And then they're now at uh, Ephesus at the end of Paul's life, helping Timothy in that, that stand for the message of grace. Quite a couple. And uh, I thought it would important to point out to them, uh, to you, that not only why it says greet, they greet you much in the Lord, but that particular couple, what a testimony couple they are. So 1 Corinthians 16, verse 19, the churches of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord with the church that is in their house. Then he says in verse 20, all the brethren greet you. So he's already sent greetings from the churches of Asia and then from Aquila and Priscilla and then he says, all the brethren greet you. Well, you, we've studied enough to realize that Paul, is, is, as he's writing this, has sent out people and, uh, to take up a collection for the poor saints at Jerusalem. He hasn't got to Corinth yet to take up that collection, so he writes 2 Corinthians to prepare him a little bit further. But that's how chapter 16 started out, how there's this collection, put it aside, and then you appoint people to travel with that money with you. When you read Acts chapter 20, and what is it, verse 4 there, that he'll actually name several people that are already with him. Churches that have already collected the money, they're traveling with the Apostle Paul, they're stopping at other places as he's making his way to Jerusalem with this money. So when you read verse 20 and it says, all the brethren greet you, the brethren he's talking about are all the brethren that are from other churches other than Asia who are traveling with Paul, taking up this collection on their way with this poor, for the, the support for Jerusalem there, the poor saints at Jerusalem. So that's who he's referring to in verse 20 of 1 Corinthians 16, all the brethren greet you. Then, then he says an exhortation directly to the, to the Corinthians. Greet ye one another with a holy kiss. What a strange time to read that verse. <laughs> We're not even shaking hands these days. <laughs> uh, and yet you got this exhortation about greeting each other with a holy kiss. I, I thought, man, how ironic. How do I preach that? <laughs> and I slip in, I slip out. <laughs> and I, uh, but to greet, customs do change. And I, I just say this kind of quickly because... We've already talked about the head covering back in chapter 11. Do the women have to wear a head covering? And that was a custom in Bible days that had a meaning to it. You know in Bible days they kissed as a greeting. They still do in the Middle East over there. That's just the way they greet. 
our custom has changed, and, and the question is, do we have to follow Bible customs? And some people say we do, and I, I would never argue. I mean, someone's going to say, hey, the Bible says it, we've got to do it that way. I wouldn't argue with them. I'm just not convinced that we have to do it exactly how they did it. I think we have to show, the women have to show the submissiveness, not only to their husbands, but to their place in society. I think that, uh, uh, that we need to greet each other in whatever way we do. But the reason I say that is I've never seen anybody consistent. Someone who would say that, who say you gotta have the head covering, I've never seen them kiss anybody. But even so, I've been in their home, people, I know people that teach this, I've been in their home, they never wash my feet, never. I mean, that's part of the greeting there. And, uh, and, 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 and you know, you think about that, when you have a piece of bread, you probably have sliced bread, don't you? You never break bread, do you? You know, I, you know we do things differently, but uh, we could take, you, when we have our communion, we don't have to do it like the Corinthians. That's why I keep talking about communion. Everybody made it such a religious thing, but they also, they, they make it like you, you have to do it like the Corinthians. Uh, there's been a time we actually took and broke bread, but you probably don't want anybody handling your bread before you get it, so uh, whoever prepares it usually cuts it up ahead of time and then we pass out chunks of bread. Uh, but anyhow, the, you get the idea, you decide yourself whether you have to do it exactly as the Bible says or do you have to do what the Bible is admonishing us to do, and that is to greet one another, to make sure that everybody is, is acknowledged and is appreciated as we come together. Paul says, greet one another with a holy kiss. And by the way, you know why he says holy kiss? Before the Apostle Paul talked about greeting someone with a holy kiss, prior to his saying that, do you know what kind of kiss took place prior to that? Luke chapter 22, <coughs> verse 47 says, I, I didn't tell you to turn there, but I'm reading it. Luke 22:47. you know, I, unless I got used to preaching to the camera, <laughs> where I don't expect you to go there anymore. <laughs> but uh, hopefully you were going there when you're at home. Anyhow, Luke chapter 22, verse 47 says this, And while he yet spake, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, behold a, multitude, uh, behold a multitude, and he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? Now that is not a holy kiss. But they did kiss. And, uh, and, but there, it, it's interesting, Paul says a holy kiss because what he's talking about there is, is a kiss that is sacred, that's pure. Um, you know, certainly the, the purity of, of what that kiss, a, a pure, sincere greeting is what he's talking about. And I've heard people talk about a holy kiss. It means to touch. Well, I studied, I looked at all the verses in the Bible about kiss and this one makes it real clear what we're talking about. Uh, and uh, just listen to it. Uh, Proverbs chapter 24, verse 26, which interestingly is about justice uh, and a, a proper justice. And, and a per person who's just, it says this, every man shall kiss his lips that giveth a right answer. So when we talk about kiss, we're talking lips, smack on the lips. <laughs> it's not just touch someone where a handshake is the same thing. Well, the kiss meant just what you know what it means, but here it has to do with greeting one another and making sure there's affection and purity uh, with our greeting, not just, yeah, how you doing? Don't tell me how you're doing. I really don't want to know. <laughs> that there really is a, 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 an affection and appreciation for each of the saints. So Paul writes to them and says, greet one another with a holy kiss. Uh, then he says in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 21, it says, the salutation, now remember everybody was saluting the Corinthians, which means to greet. But now Paul says, the salutation of me, Paul, with my own hand. Now, that's an interesting thing. Salutation of me, Paul. Now, now, now he's getting personal. Hear him. He's now sending. And a salutation is a salute. Uh, it is a greeting. Uh, it, 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 it is Paul's personal greeting to the Corinthians uh, as he writes this letter. Uh, when he says, the salutation of me, Paul, I want you to look at two other passages. I want you to see this. Come over with me to Colossians chapter 4, where Paul says a similar thing. 
Colossians chapter 4 and verse 18. Now I'm going to read that Corinthians passage so it rings in your head. The salutation of me, Paul, with my own hand. Colossians chapter 4, verse 18. The salutation by the hand of me, Paul. Remember my bonds, grace be with you all, amen. Then come over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 17 and 18. The salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is a token in every epistle, so, so I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now, the salutation. It is a greeting. It's interesting, Paul begins every one of his epistles with his name, Paul. And, and he's making a declaration. You might remember over there in Romans chapter 16 where it says, I, Tertullius, who wrote this epistle, salute you. And, uh, and, and, and what, it, what he's talking about there is Tertullius was the secretary, so to speak, of the apostle. Paul dictated the book of Romans. Tertullius wrote it down. But right at the end, he, he was able to write his own personal greetings sending to the, the Romans so that... Uh, so that he added his own information. He didn't write the book of Romans. Romans is written by the Apostle Paul, but he's actually the penman that wrote it. So Paul used secretaries to write. He had a blindness problem. So, so Paul does that, but he's telling us that there's something that when he gives a salutation of me, Paul, with my own hand, there is something in every epistle that Paul did with his own hand that would identify that it's from the Apostle Paul. And that's important in 2 Thessalonians because remember chapter 2 in verse 2? It says that ye be not soon shaken in mind nor troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us as the day of Christ is at hand. These people received a fake letter as if it was from Paul. So at the end of 2 Thessalonians, he makes that statement, the salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is a token in every epistle. You know that other one's a fraud because it don't have my signature on it. Now the question is, is his signature when he says Paul, did he write Paul at the end, like we do at the end of a letter? Or was it Paul at the beginning of every letter that he wrote with his own hand? But there's something that he wrote with his own hand. I personally think, and I, I, no proof of this, but I personally think it's what he said right after that. Uh, you know, the, if it, I guess maybe a, a, a colon or some, uh, yeah, a colon would have to be that to, to prove it. But in verse 18 of Second Thessalonians, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. I'm wondering if that's not what Paul wrote at the end of what, every one of his epistles. I went through every one of his epistles looking at how each one ends. And it's interesting how, how it's done there. Um, in, in, as we're reading it in 2 Thessalonians here, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. That's exactly what's in Romans 16, 24, Philippians chapter 4, verse 23, and, and 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 18. He shortens it by leaving the word all out and just says the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you in 1 Corinthians 16.23 where we're studying and in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 28. But then he gets a little bit, it goes a little further in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 24. He says the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Oh by the way, amen is the last word in every one of Paul's epistles. Uh, but, but So he says something different, but he's still extending that grace. Uh, or there's even the, the other versions where he says, the grace, of our, the grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. That's Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 24. Uh, he says, grace be with you in Colossians 4.18 and in 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 22. Gets more personal in 1 Timothy 6.21, he says, grace be with thee. And then he says uh, in, in Galatians chapter, and it's interesting, Galatians 6.18 and Philemon verse 25, he says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. So every one of them ends where he extends that grace, and there's a difference. Paul begins every one of his epistles, grace to you and peace from God our Father. He's extending grace. But here he's saying something about grace being with you. 
as if after the epistle is read, the truth of God's grace that's been extended to us becomes part of us. I call it infused. Where Paul's saying, be with your spirit, the way you think, the way you're going to react. Uh, and er, when he says at the end of, one of every one of his epistles, he mentions that grace being with them, and it's being a part of them, that God's grace has touched our life and become part of our life too. And he's praying that as he writes at the end of every epistle. I think that extension of grace at the end is what he writes in every one of his epistles. Uh, but I'll let you think about that and, and decide that. But there is a signature where everybody knew that the epistle they received, as a gen- received was a genuine epistle from the Apostle Paul. Now back to 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 22. What an interesting passage of scripture. I mean, after everything we studied, Paul makes this statement in verse 22. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema, maranatha. And you know, Pastor Jordan at the end of all of, almost all of the Forgotten Truths programs, he, he just closes by saying maranatha. He's got, his, what, he's got the same introduction and the same conclusion of almost every message. And we get often people write, what does that mean? What do you mean maranatha? Uh, they could have just looked look it up. But here he says, uh, if any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema, maranatha. And, and so we're studying uh, anathema. Let's start with that word. It means banned, like to be banned, the excommunicated, the idea there. It actually means to be accursed. In Romans 9 and verse 3, yeah, 9, Romans 9, 3, Paul said, I wish, I, I could wish myself accursed from Christ, from my brother and my kinsmen according to the flesh. Paul realizes that his calling, his salvation, and his commission has cut off the nation of Israel. And he, he didn't say he, did, he wished it. He said, I could wish it. That I wish myself a curse from Christ. I mean, cut off from Christ. Because if, he wasn't, if God didn't interrupt the program and save him, he would, God would still be dealing with the nation of Israel. And that's a, a, a clear statement there that God did something different when he saved Saul of Tarsus and made him Paul the apostle to the Gentiles. But Paul, when he used that word, a curse there, that's the, that's the same, that's the idea of, uh, of anathema. And that's, that's a pretty strong language. Uh, sometimes I, when people use that word, I think they, they lighten it, uh, the sense of it. Um, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 3, I forgot what that one was. <laughs> I just slipped my mind. It says, oh yeah. Wherefore, I, have, I give you to understand that no man speaketh by the Spirit of God, calleth Jesus accursed. <laughs> Someone's saying something accursed about Jesus Christ, he's not speaking by the Spirit of God. So you realize that's pretty strong language. Galatians chapter 1, verse 8 says, Though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Then he turns around and says, As I said before, so say I now again, if any man preach... It's first, we are an, uh, if we are an angel from heaven, then the next verse says, or any man preach unto you uh, any other gospel other than you have received, let him be accursed. So Paul preached it and they received it, and if Paul comes by and says something different, let him be accursed. If, if an angel comes down and says something else, let him be accursed. If any man says anything other than what Paul preached and they received concerning the gospel, let him be accursed. And we're talking about the gospel that saves souls. And when Paul says, let him be accursed, he, I don't think that's light language. I don't think he's just saying, be, you know, let him be banned, excommunicated. I, I actually, like what he says later on in, in that book, he's, he says, I wish they were cut off. And he, that's a real strong statement that he's making there. And anathema, I'm, I'm thinking it's talking about being damned, cut off from God. Uh, so we don't damn. He said, let him be damned. Treat him as if he is damned. In this verse, he says, if any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema. Let him be accursed. Let him be cut off from Christ. Uh, I believe that that's the meaning to that in here, and it is that strong of a language. Over in Acts, there were some men that made made a vow to kill the Apostle Paul, and they actually declared, we have put ourselves under a great curse. That's anathema. <laughs> like, like, we're going to die, we're going to be cut off from the land of the living if we don't fulfill this. 
So anathema is a very strong statement to make. Then he says, Maranatha. Maranatha is our Lord cometh. The Lord's coming. And, uh, and, and so even part of the definition, when I looked it up in the Strong's definition, has this included in the definition. An ec- uh, exclam- exclamation of approaching divine judgment. And that's true. Think about Paul says, if any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema, maranatha. Let him be cut off, let him be damned when the Lord cometh. And I believe he means it. Don't forget, Paul writing to the Corinthians, he has some people that are trying to turn the Corinthians away from him. Turning them away to, to, in, in, to, onto false teaching. Even, even attacking Paul personally as being an apostle. Uh, even turning people not only away from the gospel, but the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's all in chapter 15 there. So that when Paul's making this statement, he is, he's defending the gospel message. And if any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema when the Lord cometh. Let him be accursed when the Lord cometh. Now watch this. Come with me to Acts chapter 19. That's exactly what Paul taught when he began to preach. We always talk about time past, but now, ages to come. So when Paul was at, at uh, Athens and he began to preach to them, just pick up in verse 9, Acts chapter 19, verse 9, it says, But when diverse were hardened, and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude, he departed from them, oh wait a minute, I want 17. <laughs> I knew that one right. <laughs> Sounded like I was on the right track, didn't it? <laughs> now he's at Athens. I'll start in verse 29. Acts 17, verse 29. For as much then as Paul's preaching, as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think of the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone or graven by art and man's devices, device. And the times of this ignorance God winked at. Now that's, he's talking about time past, us Gentiles, we worshiped idols. And we ought not think that the Godhead is some idol that came out of the art or out of some man's device, out of his head, out of his imagination. We don't think that God is like that. And at that time past, God winked at. When the Gentiles were in that idolatry, God closed his eyes to us Gentiles, turned to the nation of Israel. But notice the next, what he says after that. Uh, and the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, to change their mind, quit worshiping idols, and worship the true and living God. And, yet, and every Gentile needs the turn from idolatry to the gospel of Christ, the faith in in what God has declared about the gospel of Jesus Christ, to be saved, because, he says, because he hath appointed a day in, in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, wherein he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he has raised him from the dead. Time passed, God turned, closed his eyes to the Gentiles. But now is commanding all men to repent. What if they don't? Well, he's appointed a day, that's the future, where he's going to judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he raised from the dead. You reject the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Lord is coming back, and he's coming back in divine judgment. And if any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema, maranatha. Let him be cut off from Christ when the Lord cometh. Because Paul's preaching, the Lord is coming. And we have this opportunity in grace to believe, but if a man chooses not to believe in this age of grace, then he is going to be damned. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now when I made the statement earlier about the rapture coming soon, it's these verses that make me think about the rapture. (laughs) There, Paul looked, looked as if it could come in his lifetime. And I think every generation ought to live with that anticipation of the Lord coming in our lifetime. But when he comes, 
He, he says in uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 10, he says, uh, it's talking about the Antichrist coming, that he's coming in verse 10 with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion. He's going to let the Antichrist do signs and wonders to deceive people. They'll be deluded by that. They'll be deceived by that. So Satan is going to come with all that, unde- with all that uh, unright- uh, deceivableness, sort of unrighteousness, because the people didn't love the truth that they might be saved. And so verse 11, For this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned, who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. God in this age of grace has been very gracious, extended it more than 2,000 years, given people an opportunity to turn from idolatry, turn from religion, turn from all, all that stuff that comes out of the imagination of man, and realize what has been done for them by Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, how he died for our sins, was buried, that he rose again for our justification, that God by his grace freely gives us eternal life when we just trust Jesus Christ as our Savior. But the world doesn't love the truth. And so there's coming a time where grace is going to end. And when it ends, Satan is going to come with all deceivableness because God is going to allow him to have all that deceivable power so that people will be damned who love not the truth. So that there is no messing around with God. When he, when he comes back, grace is over. And when the rapture takes place, that's when Satan is loosed. To go ahead with all that undeceivableness. Uh, deceivableness. That you think about that in Corinthians. Paul having all the, the different people causing problems, trying to prevent the Corinthians from knowing the truth, walking in the truth, believing the truth. And Paul says, if any man love not the Lord Jesus, he's talking about lost people. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema when the Lord cometh. Let him be accursed. Let him be damned when the Lord cometh. That's exactly what's going to happen. Because when they hear the truth and deny the truth, then God sends strong delusions so that they will be damned. So that's what he's saying at at Corinth there. Now, like I said, I could have stretched this out, but I don't want to. When it says, if... If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, love is a choice of will. It has to be a choice. There's no predestinating and all that stuff that God determining who's saved and who's not. Love is a choice. It has, otherwise, it's not love. It's a choice of the will. And the Apostle Paul uses that word just a few times in, in a sense of the fact that he says in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So God's commending his love to us. But that love has to be received. And faith is, a, when he, Paul talks about love not the Lord Jesus Christ, faith is a means, is a, is a decision of choice of receiving the love of God. And Paul can use that to, to say love back. For instance, you remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, where he says, I have not seen nor ear hath heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him, that God hath revealed them to us by his Spirit. When Paul says to them that love him, we're talking about those who have chose to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, to receive the love of God. And that choice of faith is <coughs> what Paul is using as love. He says in Romans chapter uh, uh, 828, All things work to the good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. Well, who's that? That's all believers. (laughs) But instead of saying to all believers, he's saying to those who love God. To those who have made a decision in their heart, a willing decision to trust Jesus Christ, to receive the love of God, to trust Jesus Christ as his Savior. So that, 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 that is what, when he says there, if any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, If any man has not chose to receive God's love and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be damned when the Lord cometh. And that's exactly what's going to happen. I believe that's what 2 Corinthians. So Paul's got some strong language for those who are rejecting God's word. And and one that that lost people ought to wake up to. Uh, So it's 
you know, it's not nice and flowery. But in, second, in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, after he makes that statement, in verse 22, in verses 23 and 24, now we have Paul's, uh, what I call it, the it, it, sentiment toward the Corinthians. Uh, verse 23, we've kind of talked about already, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Uh, I believe that's the salutation that Paul actually wrote, but, but he is talking about that grace now of God being with you. So verse 22 is about lost people. Verse 20, 23 is about the believer. And then Paul writes in verse 24, My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. Interesting way to close that book. I mean, this book has been a book about reproof, about rebuke, uh, about correction, certainly a book about instruction and righteousness, but Paul had to talk pretty hard. He talks even harder in 2 Corinthians to, the, uh, to these Corinthians, and yet everything that he said, he's been saying with love, and he, may, he wants to make sure they know that. So he closes by saying, my love be with you all in Christ Jesus. He's actually practicing verse 14. Remember verse 14? Let all your things be done with charity. Paul, when he writes the book of Ephesians, he says, speaking the truth in Christ. Uh, no. <laughs> he says, uh, I can't believe I didn't. That's it. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things. Ruining my conclusion of this whole thing. <laughs> but Paul is, there, there's, there is real sincerity here that everything that he wrote in the book of Corinthians, you could actually, because of that verse, you could label a title above 1 Corinthians a book of love, a letter of love. Because Paul, everything that he wrote in here, he is practicing love. He is speaking the truth in love. Because if you love someone, you'll speak to the truth to them. And all the correction, all the rebuke, none of it has been anger, none of it has been personal in that, recent, in that regard. It's been an expression of love, telling them what's true, where to stand, what to do, what honors God, and that God's grace be with them. So it is a, certainly an epistle of love. And that concludes the book of 1 Corinthians. Pray it's been a, a good study. You have to go back and read it all over again. Try to remember what you've picked up along the way. Uh, but that's how God wrote his word, is that we're never done reading it. We read it over and over again, and piece by piece it becomes part of our life. The grace of God be with you. Amen. Our God and our Father, we do thank you for, for the Bible. We thank you that it is the amen. It's the so be it. Father, we do pray that as we study it, that we don't just get the historical out of it, uh, that we don't just get controversy and arguments out of it and divisions like the Corinthians were going, were going through. But Father, that we, we learn the doctrine, we learn of your grace, we learn of growth, that we can take doctrine, reprove, correction, and instruction and in righteousness from it, and that our lives would be transformed in such a way that we'd be vessels of honor fit for your use. We pray that this book of Corinthians has done that for each one of us, and always as we study your Bible together, may that be the, the fruit of it. In the Savior's name we pray, amen. <laughs>